court poaching and training. I consider it personal training. It's a very daring and uh, out of the way thing to be. And uh, the cookhouse is rather short of fresh meat anyway, so. I not only trained myself, I provided something for the cookhouse. Pat Riley, an Irish American. He has to smudge the writing on his papers to join the British Army. Johnny Cooper, too young to join up, he got in by bribing a recruiting sergeant. I had a lot of problems getting into the army because they thought that I wasn't big enough and um, they turned me down. And then I was tipped off by um, a friend of mine who was living in the same accommodation in Bradford when I was learning apprenticeship and said, look, you go down and try and join the guards, but do take two half crowns with you. Red Seekings, fiddle his name onto a special duties list for commando training without his commanding officer knowing. Bob Bennett got into trouble in the guards for always volunteering for hazardous assignments. A friend of my lofty baker and myself volunteered for everything that came up on detail, things like machine gunner, hollow trawler, rear gunner. And we eventually were taken in front of a, an officer who said if we volunteered for anything else, uh, we'd be punished. Dave Kershaw fought against Franco, hardened socialist who got on well with the aristocratic Sterling. I remember he said to me, what will your wife say if she that you've joined this uh, parachute unit? I said, she won't know what to say. <laughs> she, she won't know what anything at all about it. Dave Kershaw wasn't at the dinner. Dave was seriously ill. He had done his and been driven home. He died the next morning. The originals said it only held on to life to put a store. Also present at the dinner are two others who are not there on day one, but who are assigned honorary original status. Mike Sadler, desert navigator, who'll play a key role in one of the original's most spectacular desert operations. And the very reverend Fraser McCluskey, he'll parachute and occupy with the originals. These are the men today's SAS call the originals. But they also have another name for them after the Hollywood film. Dozen. Yeah. Cheers to the Colonel. Colonel David. Colonel David. So, Sterling has his unit and he has his men. But now, the bureaucrats who oppose him in headquarters Middle East descend. It's time for the very first session. But it's not one you'll see in any official history book. North Africa, 1941. David Sterling, a young Scots Guards lieutenant, has a revolutionary idea from of war. King's idea, the SAS, the generals approve, but now his enemies at Middle East headquarters try to stop him. What happens next breaks all the rules, isn't in any official history the first ever operation for the SAS. We simply weren't able to get what we'd been assigned and we were told it would take several weeks, which we couldn't afford. We had to get down to training immediately. We were taken to a spot on the Suez Canal, a place called Cabrit, which was just an expanse of sand going down to the Suez Canal. When I arrived there, there was a little board stood in the ground. It just said L Detachment. There was a vast space behind it. And someone said, well, where's, where's the camp? And Colonel David said, well, that's the first job, is to steal one. And down the bottom of the road, about two miles down the road, was a great big New Zealand camp, and they were up in the desert operating. And that evening, we were taken down to Kiwi camp, where we stole tents, uh, tents for the officer's mess, tent for the science mess, we stole the piano, stole everything, the whole camp. By next morning, we had a, probably the best camp in the area. I've forgotten what we did for the piano. I think we gave it back to them so, as part of a bribe to hold them, which they didn't, and they laughed quite a lot at the end because they, they couldn't help but identify where they had all gone. 
The infant SAS train themselves. Parachuting, explosives, desert navigation and survival. At the heart of this is Jock Lewis. He was probably the greatest training officer without question, I think, in the Middle East area. He improvised all kinds of new techniques, which uh, became the foundation, really, of today's SAS. He never did a thing that uh, he wouldn't do himself, never asked us to do a thing that he wouldn't do himself. And he set the example all the time, so what could you do? He, he jumps off a truck at 40 mile an hour, and he asks you to jump off at 30. You just did it. You can't argue against people like that. But the first real parachute drop will end in tragedy. So the first plane took off, loaded up. I myself was on the second lift, standing with Dave Kershaw and the rest of the chaps. Dave Kershaw said, I'm sure something came out from the plane. And I said, well, if it had it, then they'd shoot. And Jock Lewis explained that uh, Warburton, a chap named Warburton and a chap named Duffy uh, had been killed and what had happened. The ring had jumped over the hooks, hadn't developed. Uh, and Jock Lewis, being the man he was, said that hooks would be made safe and we'd all be jumping in the morning. And we all went back to our tents with a 50 tin of cigarettes and smoked till the next morning. And the next morning uh, convinced me that I was with the right uh, they were offered uh, at that parade to leave the, the unit if they wanted to and not one uh, left and from then on the jumping uh, went perfectly okay but there's a problem the original's primary mission is to destroy enemy aircraft and to do this effectively they need a bomb which will both explode and ignite at the same time and it must be small enough for them to carry 10 to 20 each the engineers can't help they create an explosion, Three, but no ignition. One, five, or ignition with not enough bang. Three, two, one, five. Engineers say there's no way of combining the two. So Jock Lewis invents his own, the Lewis bomb. Plastic explodes engine oil, thermite, and steel filings. The great day arrived, and... Uh... Uh, Jock had mixed up a mixture of uh, plastic thermite and steel filings. That was the secret, steel filings. Three, two, one. And, uh, of course, the, the thing blew up. And, uh, oh, it was a great moment, a great moment. To any regiment, its badge is sacrosanct. Sterling knows this. He runs a competition for the unit's own badge and motto. The badge winner is what is now famous as the Winged Excalibur. The front runner for the motto is Descend to Defend. Sterling changes it to Who Dares Wins. But again, there's a problem. It's all unofficial. Sterling resorts to a military custom. If a general salutes the badge, he authorizes it. Uh, the traffic uh, uh, did a walking deck when he came down to do it. Incredibly, that inspection was captured in a few feet of film. This is it. It has lain in the archives for over 60 years. I was standing at one side to him, the uh, demonstration that we laid on for him. And then I, uh, as he was coming up to the salute, I turned to him, and he slept, so that was it. November 1941. It's time for the <laughs> Allied commanders are about to launch Operation Crusader. Objective, push back the enemy lines and relieve Tobruk. But the enemy's air superiority is a danger. Sterling a in his paper to the generals. The SAS will parachute behind the lines and eliminate enemy aircraft at the key airfields at Ghazal and Tamimi. Then they'll exfiltrate across the Great Sand Sea to a rendezvous with the Long Range Desert Group, the LRDG. 
the LRD 